Hey, what's going on guys? David here. I, uh, in case you can't tell, I'm on my lunch break. But I just wanted to pop in and talk to you guys for a minute. So, today we're going to talk about emotions. I'm saying, but Dave, emotions have nothing to do with investing. You're wrong. I'm going to tell you why, right now. Emotions will ruin your life. I know that's a bold statement. Hear me out. If you've ever gone through a really bad breakup and you look back a couple years later on all of the decisions that were made, you might realize what I'm talking about here. You made some pretty stupid decisions when you were emotionally distraught. Unfortunately, those same emotions get involved in investing. They get involved in relationships. They get involved in work, which is why the Marine Corps and the military talks about separating work from personal life. It's not that we don't care about your family or your personal life. It's just that you need to be able to take those emotions and leave them at home so you can be effective in the workplace. Especially if you're in a combat arms MOS where you having a really emotional day may very well get one of your fellow Marines, soldiers, airmen, sailors killed. We can't have that. So emotion needs to be set aside. Now, I'm going to stop talking about the personal life. We're going to talk about why you need to stop looking at houses. All right. I sat through a seminar a couple weeks back and the guy was like, stop looking at houses, stop looking at houses, stop looking at houses, stop looking at houses. And although he said it a million times redundantly, he was 100% correct. And here's why. Let's say that investor A decides that he wants to buy a house. And he and his wife decide, hey, this place looks nice. Let's go take a look at it. And they go to this, we'll say a duplex. And they walk in the duplex and it's got really nice granite countertops and brand new cabinets, fancy doorknobs, one of those doorbells that lets you see who's outside the door while you're talking to them to decide if you want to let them in or pretend you're not home even though they saw you in the door. It's got all the bells and whistles, right? This house is great. And you fall in love with it. And you decide this is the one. This is the house that somebody wants to rent in. We're going to buy this place today. Well, it's all well and good, but who knows what the numbers look like. Right? So you just got attached to a place that got renovated very, very high end, but unless you're getting the money out of those renovations, you may not find that the rent equals the purchase price. If you buy a house with a fancy kitchen and a granite countertop, the seller's going to want top dollar. Well, you buying at top dollar doesn't really help your cash flow very much because now you're spending a little bit more on a mortgage, you're spending more here, you're spending more there. No. When you renovate for cash flow, you don't want to do a bad job renovating, but you want to have like builder grade materials. You want to have cheaper, not cheap materials, but rather than granite, maybe something that looks like granite. Because what if you have this fancy countertop that costs you tons of money and your tenant trashes it? Now that's not to say that upgrading when you have to fix something anyway is a bad idea, but we'll talk about upgrade hacking later. Now, that's A. Then we got guy number B. Yes, I said number B. No, I'm not going to edit that out. In fact, I'll just leave all this mumbo jumbo in here because I'm editing and I can do what I want. So, enjoy. So, guy B, right, runs the numbers, gets an income expense report, has a property manager go on the inspection to see what the leases look like and see what kind of clientele your tenants are, has the agent do her due diligence, really thoroughly runs through the numbers and may or may not ever look at the property. Who do you think got the better investment? It's B. I know you already knew that. The reason it's B is because they bought based on numbers, based on facts, based on statistics, based on research. They did not involve emotion. Now, it's okay to look at a house and say it looks nice, right? Grant Cardone talks about this all the time. If an apartment complex looks like trash, he's not interested. I am because for me, if an apartment complex looks like trash, that means I can add value and turn it around and turn it into a very good property. But again, I'm not buying because the place feels good, because the place looks good. I'm buying because it's going to add money to my pocket so that I can retire. And that's the way you need to look at properties, and that's the way you need to analyze deals. That's why if you're watching Analysis Wednesday, you'll realize that I will scrap deals that look totally fine. You'll even hear me say, wow, this looks like a decent place at a decent price. Doesn't matter. Numbers didn't work. <laughs> Gone. All right? Don't get emotional about your real estate investing, about your stocks, about your car, about your house, about your relationships at work, about anything, right? The moment you get emotional and you allow feelings to get involved, you start acting irrational. You need to kind of understand how to step back, look at things from above, right? Looking down the box, 
and analyze a situation objectively. That's going to give you the most success throughout real estate investing, throughout your life. Now, all of this aside, it's okay to look at the property. In fact, I encourage looking at real estate. I don't think you should just totally avoid it. But don't look at a property until after you've analyzed the numbers. Again, if you watch my videos, you'll see time and time again that I run the numbers, maybe click through a picture or two, but I run the numbers before I waste any time. I won't text my agent, I won't talk to my property manager, I won't phone a friend, I won't use a lifeline, nothing until I have run the numbers, at least the basic numbers, usually the bigger pockets analysis tool as well, and thoroughly concluded that any time I waste on this property is not time wasted on this property. The deal might not work out, that's okay. But at least I know I'm using my time wisely and focusing on doing those high dollar per hour tasks. All right guys, this has been a short lunch break version of a YouTube video and I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of this. Just something that was on my mind. I hear people talking, I hear people reach out to me talking about properties and they use words that describe the color and the siding and the this and the that. And if you ever send me a deal, I'll be happy to look at it for you. But I'm gonna tell you right now, if you send me a deal, and you send me something and all it shows me is a picture and asking price, my response is going to be, I need more information. I need to see the profit and loss, income expense reports. I need to know net operating income. Most importantly, at least bring me the gross rents. If the rents aren't listed on the property, which sometimes they're not because it might have just been somebody's residence, use the app or the website for Rentometer and just search for the that size building in that zip code and it'll give you an estimate. Don't use the top number, right? If it says $600 average up to $850 or $500, don't use $850 because that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get $850. That might be the house with the granite countertops and the fancy gold toilet. That might not be your place. Use the middle number or use the lowest number and then you have an even better chance of buying a discount property and a solid deal. So remember guys, take your emotion out, objective, objective, objective research, Phone a friend, ask a buddy, send the deal somewhere. Just verify that you weren't getting emotional and enjoy the profits of remaining objective and actually analyzing your deals. Again, don't get stuck in analysis paralysis though. Make sure you pull the trigger and take action. That's how you get successful. Boom!